May these words be spoken and heard in the power of love. Please be seated. Around the year 55, in the way that we count the years, Paul wrote these words that I'm going to read out in a moment near the beginning of his letter to the rather high maintenance, as we might say these days, high maintenance Christian community in the port city of Corinth. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or... I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptised in the name of Paul? Back then, 25 years after Easter, Peter and Paul were leaders of different factions in the early church, and at least once, they went head to head in a very public argument, as Paul himself describes. This is from Galatians. But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came down from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you though a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews. Isn't it interesting to see that they were just as divided in the first generation after Easter as we are today? According to tradition, both Peter and Paul ended up in Rome and both died there as martyrs, although not at the same event, as it were. For decades after their deaths, the early Christian community, so through the rest of the first century into the beginning of the second century, Christians were divided over their respected legacies. The internal warfare did not stop just because Peter and Paul were dead. And in particular, Paul was on the nose with a lot of Christians, uh, even though in time his point of view was to prevail. And, and indeed, by the time we get to the middle of the second century, the church has become very much a church that thinks the way Paul thought. So I wonder how they feel about having to share a festival day on the 29th of June each year, or if they're still kind of pointing fingers at each other. Remember that synod in Jerusalem? You scoundrel, and so on. Our task today is not to trace their personal stories, about which we know very little, or to reconcile the differences between them, but as always, we're looking for spiritual wisdom for our own lives in our situation today. For sure, they were two very different characters. And that may actually be the major insight, the major little piece of wisdom that we take away from this reflection. We each have to be our own selves rather than seeking to fit in with how somebody else thinks we should believe or behave or worship. Their life experiences, in fact, were about as different as two Jewish men both living in the early Roman Empire could be. Let's start with Peter. Peter was a Galilean Jew, in other words, not from Jerusalem, not from a good postcode, from the village of Bethsaida, which of course is close to my heart since I've digged there, 
but may already have relocated to Capernaum by the time he encountered Jesus. Like a lot of other people in the Capernaum Bethsaida area, he was a fisher. He was involved in the fishing industry. It was the major economic activity on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee in those days. And Jesus seems to have particularly targeted that corner and those fishing workers. But that's a whole other talk for some other day. Peter was uneducated and of low social status. Yet Jesus identified him as a leader and he's always named first in the list of the apostles. And of course we tend to call him Peter, but that was not his real name. Peter Rocky is a nickname given to him by Jesus. His original name, of course, was Simeon. Peter, and we, we know that we know that sort of set of words, the nickname he's given is the rock. And that nickname seems to have stuck. And it, as you may have noticed, even Paul refers to him by the Aramaic form of the nickname, Cephas, in Greek, Petros, or Peter for us. Rocky, as I like to call him, Peter to you, was the first witness of the resurrection, the one to whom Jesus appears, first of the inner group of disciples. Obviously, Mary Magdalene is listed as the first. He'd never been to school, but he knew something that no school could ever offer him. He knew more about Jesus than we shall ever understand. Peter was there. And in Jesus' eyes, Peter was the leader of the pack. We've just heard in that reading from the Gospel a beautiful legend about a, a beachside chat between Jesus and Peter a few days after Easter. Paul, on the other hand, was a very different kind of character. And it's not surprising they clashed. They went to different theological colleges. Well, to be fair, Peter didn't go to any theological college. Paul was not a Galilean Jew, thank you very much. He was a Jew from the diaspora, but with highly developed religious identity and very strong Jerusalem connections. Writing to the Philippians, um, Paul was to say, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. He didn't have a problem with ego. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. A bit narky, but a pretty kind of highly polished CV. Paul had a first-class Jewish pedigree and may even have had Roman citizenship. At least that's how he's described in one story in the book of Acts. But for the early followers of Jesus, Paul was an outsider. And he seems never to have seen or heard or to have met Jesus. Their lives would have overlapped, but as far as we can tell, they never encountered each other. The outsider became an insider, and in many ways the greatest Christian leader of all time, because of a religious experience in which he believed he had encountered the risen Jesus. And that turned his life around. We get a special holy day for that, the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul in January. Paul, of course, never being short on ego, Paul considered himself just as much an apostle as the group he called the so-called pillars of the church, Peter, James, and John. And the faith that we have is incredibly indebted to Paul and indeed bears hardly a trace of Peter. Peter's greatest asset was simply that he knew Jesus from back before Easter. He could say things like, and I'm sure he enjoyed saying things like that when getting together with Paul, 
When Jesus and I discussed this, and Paul would go, you can imagine, or that time when Jesus and I went, okay, and Paul could never, of course, match that. Paul, on the other hand, appealed to scripture and to Greek philosophy and to his own religious experience of Jesus as a present reality in his life after Easter. Peter was more likely to stay with the ancient Jewish traditions while Paul was prepared to throw away all the traditions, even though, as a Pharisee, he was deeply trained in them. Hang on to that idea, Paul the Pharisee. In the Gospels, the Pharisees are not exactly yeah, Jesus' best friends. Okay? Paul the Pharisee. Peter tells us what Jesus was like. Paul tells us what difference Jesus made. Interesting. We need both those voices. And I suggest we especially need the voice of Peter to keep Paul a little bit more grounded in the historical reality of Jesus. One of the fault lines in contemporary Christianity because believe it or not, we still have our factions and we still have our arguments, is between those who prefer to shape their lives and their theology around Jesus in the Gospels and those who say, well, never mind the Gospels, that's interesting kind of stories, but it's the voice of Paul that really determines what it is that we need to believe. And perhaps what we most need to do is to stay engaged with both of those conversations. We need to be exploring, of course, the meaning of God in Christ, as Paul himself wrote at one point, reconciling the world to himself. Without that edge, our faith becomes a kind of historical society devoted to an interesting person from 2,000 years ago. But as we go deep into the mystery of what Jesus means, and that surely is our job, we must never lose sight of the real human being who proclaimed the presence of God's rule in everyday life and did so in a way that made sense to fishermen, to housewives, to farmers, and to homeless beggars. We need a bit of Paul and we need a bit of Peter in each of us. Amen.